Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so as, as you saw coming in, there's a handout and it looks the same as the prior one from, uh, that I handed out last class but didn't get around to. I decided to recopy it. I, I updated one or two minor things and also of course added a few extra pages. So you can discard the 10A handout from prior and we'll use this one. Uh, dated 16th slash 18th of March. And just to uh, recap what we've looked at so far in terms of nonlinear programming, we've looked at NLPs without constraints and we're, we're pretty good at and comfortable at understanding that was the topic in the midterm where we saw that we used line search, we used Newton's method, quasi-Newton's method can be used. So unconstrained problems are quite easily solved and so no surprise in that what we've been seeing is a way to move constrained problems to unconstrained problems. The one approach we've seen already is to um, simply just ignore the constraints and then check them at the end. And we'll see that coming up again today with the Lagrange multipliers. The second approach is to penalize deviations of the constraints. And you saw that in the assignment that you've been working through. This third approach that we're going to look at today is the Lagrange multiplier approach, which you will see does a similar step as the penalty approach, except it works for only equality constraints. We're going to see that coming up in a minute. And it penalizes deviations from that. Now, let's get a visual picture going here. When we're looking at Lagrange multipliers, I'm not sure if this was covered in your math course. Well, sorry, I know that Lagrange multipliers was covered in your math course. I'm just not sure that if you've seen the geometric interpretation of it, which is a helpful way to start and then we can go look at the algebra. So the picture that you can have in your mind and will explain everything at the end is a geometric picture where we let's just start here by looking at a simple with a simple system with two variables x1 and x2 and if we draw contours here um, we're aiming to get to that center point if this was unconstrained. So this is my unconstrained function f of x and it's a function of two variables x1 and x2 the horizontal and vertical axis which I'll just leave out here. But a constraint then modifies this. right? A constraint would be, and I'm going to draw it here in red, would be something like a nonlinear curve that comes like this. So this is a constraint, h of x is equal to some constant b. So it's a nonlinear h. It's not a linear h. And the understanding that we need to take from this from the Lagrange multiplier approach is that we have to move along that red curve. Okay, so we're, we're constrained to lie along that curve. And let's, um, let's just make this give some key direction here. We're aiming to minimize. We'll, we're heading downhill. So what you can think of it is almost like a marble or a ball sitting over here and it, it's rolling along this red curve. It has to obey that constraint, but we're trying to minimize the function. So what will happen is that this ball will roll down this function h of x. It's rolling downhill. And if it goes beyond this point, it starts to roll uphill again. So the ball will come and settle at equilibrium right at that point over there. Okay, that's the best optimum. We have to stay along h of x equals b, obey that constraint while still minimizing f of x. Okay, so if you wanted to write this mathematically, what we've solved there geometrically is the problem to minimize f of x subject to h of x equals b. That's the geometric picture to have in your mind for a single constraint, h of x. What the insight from the Lagrange multiplier method is, is that at that point, the forces are in balance on that particle. So if you want to see this purely from a physical point of view, we can see that by observing that at that location, the gradient of the h function it's also a nonlinear function, so we can calculate gradients for it. A tangential plane can be calculated, and we can find that the gradient vector for h um, is pointing in this direction here. So 
It's the gradient of h. And the gradient vector then for the function f is pointing in exactly the opposite direction. And we can make this explicit that that's the gradient at the optimum, x star. So the insight from the Lagrange approach is that at that optimum, these gradients are collinear. So if there's space still here in your area, you might want to add that here, is that the grade at the optimum, the gradients are collinear. Let's express that mathematically. Collinearity says that the gradient of the function and of the constraints are collinear can be expressed as saying that they're equal to each other. Let's use this coefficient here with v is equal to the gradient of f. Why am I introducing this coefficient v? Well, v is the constant of collinearity. These gradients are not necessarily going to have the same magnitude. So v accounts for that. So v then is simply a constant either positive or negative. So collinearity just simply means that they're pulling in the same direction or in perfect opposite direction. So that's also still collinear. If it's p in 180 degrees from each other, that's still considered collinear. Or these two vectors could be exactly parallel or parallel to each other with different magnitudes. So what V does is it just it lines up the collinearity over there for us. So that's the mathematical expression of saying something is collinear. So two things we have to notice is that at the optimum, the gradients are collinear. And the second key point we have to uh, observe is that at the optimum, we are on the constraint. So the second point is. There's a question. No? Yeah, because the vectors are going to have different magnitudes, right? So the v will, will, will make them that you can set them equal to each other. Sorry. You can simply see v as a constant of proportionality. Sorry. What, what's the 1 and the 2 that you just wrote? These are two points that you have to notice from this. Firstly, we observe that at the optimum, the gradients are collinear. And we are on the constraint at the optimum. So when we derive the Lagrange method mathematically, don't, we just don't want to just use brute force algebra. We want to actually see these two features coming out of the Lagrange method. When you learned Lagrange in second year, you probably just saw a whole lot of lambdas and set things equal to zeros, and you just believed it, right? But let's actually figure out what, what this means practically. OK, so that's the picture in your mind. Let's now try this out um, on an actual problem where we introduce the theory first and then you're going to practice it right below it. So the Lagrange multiplier method mathematically takes your, your objective function f of x subject to a variety of equality constraints. Okay. Now warning bells are probably going off here. It's like wh what's happened to inequality constraints? Okay, we'll come and address those in a minute. But for now, let's notice that the Lagrange method only works on equality constraints and multiple equality constraints. So we've got k equals 1, 2, 3, up to m equality constraints over there. And what the Lagrange method does is it forms a new function similar to the penalty approach we saw earlier. It takes that original function f of x and it forms the sum the sum has m terms, so one term in that summation for every equality constraint that you have. And it says take hk of x minus b, 
and it multi multiplies it by a Lagrange multiplier, V subscript K. OK, so that's the mathematics. Let's go try it out. I'll give you a minute to write the Lagrange function L as a function of x and v for this problem where there's three search variables, x1, x2, x3. There's two equality constraints. So two equality constraints. You should have two Lagrange multipliers. And uh, write that out there, applying that formula. <coughs> Work with the person next to you if, you, if you're not sh quite sure of what, what's going on. Okay, so you should have a V1 term and a V2, V2 term in that summation. Yeah, everyone in agreement with that? Okay, so if you're writing that, let's, it's simple substitution that our new function LXV is equal to the original function um, 6x1 squared plus uh, 4x2 squared plus x3 squared. Then we add in this summation here, so minus v1. The first constraint is expressed in the form of h minus bk. So 24x1 plus 24x2 minus 360 minus v2 times x3 minus 1. Yep. OK, so now what we're going to do is instead of minimizing this original problem, we're minimizing this revised problem. Take a look at that. It's no different to the penalty method that we've seen before. We've got our original function over here. This, this portion is my original function. And then we've got a variety of penalty terms. So you can visualize these parts here in red as as penalties in some way. If we're trying to minimize this part, we're also trying to minimize this penalty. Now, remember this is an equality constraint. So at the optimum, if we are on that constraint, 24x1 plus 24x2 will equal 360, and this term here in the brackets will disappear. So this whole thing here should be 0 at the optimum. And 0 times any constant is still 0. And at the optimum, this term should be 0. So at the optimum, this revised problem will have the same numeric value than as if we had minimized the original f of x. Is it, are you always subtracting your constraint? It's the, it's the definition for the Lagrange process. Okay, it's, subtraction it's a penalty, yeah. The sign of V can can be positive right. or negative. V is not constrained to be positive or negative. Yeah. yeah. So if we're minimizing that equation, V is positive. Then. Yeah. Okay. Because then it's well, okay. we're going to we're going to take a look at V's in a minute, right? For V positive, yes, this will minimize. If V is negative, it's going to minimize negative. But remember, we have to be. This has to be come out in at the end that this term will be zero 
Otherwise, we haven't actually, we're not obeying one of our constraints. Okay, so it will be, or it should be zero at the optimum. So I want, as this problem is, is introducing a number of things that we're going to pick up later in the theory derivation, I just wanted to show them here numerically. So when we're trying to solve this new problem now, minimize L of xv, we know that we can convert that into a different system where we minimize the derivatives of L xv and set them equal to zero. And if we can f solve this problem now where we set those first derivatives of L, it's called a Jacobian. So if we can set the Jacobian equal to zero, then that is the optimum solution. So it looks like we've actually grown the problem. We've grown the problem from three variables to five variables. We're now, instead of minimizing a function of three variables, we're now minimizing a function of five variables here. But what I'm going to show you in a while is that this actually is a reduction in some way. It reduces the size of the space that we're, we're dealing with. So let's, let's take a look at this problem just once again geometrically. Can you visualize what that objective function looks like? What does that remind you of? That first equation, 6x squared, x1 squared plus 4x2 squared plus x3 squared. Yeah, Tyler? They're all going to be positive terms. All of these are positive terms? OK. Geometrically? Sorry? The optimum will be zero if there were no constraints. Okay, but with constraints, this is not true. What shape does this have geometrically? It's a convex function. Okay, so none of, not quite the answer there, but it's true. It's a convex function. But what shape is this geometrically? Joseph, TR, quadratic. It's a quadratic ball. It's a sphere. We're in three dimensions, x1, x2, x3. If all the coefficients were, were the same value, it would be a sphere. It's, they're different coefficients, so it's a squashed sphere or an ellipsoid or a rugby ball shape. Okay? So it's, that's the visual picture of that function. You don't have to un, uh, be able to visualize every function, but if we can visualize it, it certainly helps. So let's see what the constraint does. Imagine a, a shape of a 3D sphere. And the first constraint says 24x1 plus 24x2 equals 360. That's the equation of a plane. So it's a plane that cuts through the sphere in some way. So instead of minimizing this original function, we're now operating on the sphere that's cut through by a plane. So wherever that plane intersects the sphere, so you have to imagine this in 3D. I can't draw it here on the board for you. Wherever that plane intersects the sphere is where our potential optimum lies. And there's another constraint that simplifies things down for us even further. We've got this very artificial constraint, x3 equals 1, which reduces the problem even more still. It actually takes it down from a being a three-dimensional problem, x1, x2, x3, down to a two-dimensional problem. Because this last constraint reduces the problem size and it fixes it to 1. Okay, so we could actually go back and resolve this, this objective function here as 6x1 squared plus 4x2 squared plus 1 and drop out that last constraint. Okay, but I'm doing this intentionally to drive a point home that is going to come up very soon. So what I want you to see with equality constraints is that they're actually beneficial in some way. They reduce the space in which you can search. And inequality simply says, operate to the left or to the right of this plane. But an equality is even more restrictive. It says you have to operate on this line. And so it, it's a great reduction in the space where we can find our potential solutions. OK, so we're comfortable with a geometric picture from earlier on. We're, we're seeing the algebraic interpretation of the Lagrange multiplier. And I've shown you that when we convert that problem into this form here, our new problem is finding the first derivatives equal to 0. So go ahead and set the first derivatives of that function 
two zero, and you should be able to find by hand. This maybe maybe takes t uh, about three minutes or so. Over the page, I'll, I'll leave that up there on the board. Let's find the first derivatives of L with respect to x one, with respect to x two. So you set those equal to zero. DL by DX2, set that equal to zero. DL by DX3, set that equal to zero. DL with respect to V1, set that equal to zero. And DL with respect to V2, set that equal to zero. So you're going to get five equations in five unknowns. You can solve this really quickly. You've already got one of the unknowns. x3 is equal to 1. That's the result of the Jacobian v equals 0. Eh? Right. Yeah. What I've written over there on the left-hand side board is simply this equation written out for the five constituent parts. Yeah, so give it a calculate. Try, try it out and we'll see, yeah. It was V2. V2. It's not a half, yeah. It's minus V1, minus V2, yeah. Yeah, throw each, each V over there. Oh. Wait. Kevin, do you want us to solve the equations? Yeah, absolutely. You can solve this. This is very, very solvable. There's a reason why I'm asking you to solve this by hand is because you're proving something about the theory as you're doing this, or you should notice some patterns. <coughs> 
We didn't calculate those zero values. We just like set them off. To zero. That's the definition, right. right? Set the Jacobian equal to zero is where the optimum is. So anything you notice that's special about the last two partial derivatives? Sorry? Is that two, just two constraints? The last two partial derivatives just recover the, the two constraints. Okay, So that's a good observation that we're going to see reoccurring. And remember, it, it gels with that geometric picture we saw there at the beginning. The optimum, that little ball rolling along the red line, the optimum has to lie on the constraint. So by recovering these two equations is exactly what you expect. The optimum must lie on the two constraints. So that confirms that again. OK, so now that you've got that written down, most of you should have at least solved for two or three of the unknowns, right? Or completely done? OK. So the first one we see, of course, here is that x3 is equal to 1. You can sub that in into um, this equation over here, the dl by dx3, and solve for v2. The second Lagrange multiplier has a value of 2. OK, so there's 2 out of the 5 unknowns solved for. Um, the next. Uh, way that you can go could depend on what you've done but uh, one thing that you might try is to re-express this first and second constraint in terms of v1 so you could write for example that um, x1 I'll just I'm running out of space here so just do it up here in this box x1 is equal to 2 times v1 and you could write that x2 is equal to 3 times v1, sub those both in into this fourth equation here and solve for v1. And if you do that, you get that v1 is equal to a value of 3. And then you can go recover the value of x1 and x2. So x1 is 6, and x2 is a value of 9. OK, so fairly straightforward, or just would probably require a minute or two more of your time to get to that same point. OK, so let's ask ourselves now, if we sub these values in, these are my optimums. So I could go add stars to them, x1, x2 star, v1 star, and v2 star. We notice that if we sub that in, this bracket term will, in fact, go to 0. And that bracket term will go to 0. So the optimum of L as a function of x and v is the same as the optimum for f of x. And you can confirm that for yourself because of these two zero terms over there. Let me ask you another question. Remember that when we set the derivatives of a function equal to zero, we're not sure if we're minimizing or maximizing. All we know that we're doing is that we're at a stationary point. Do we know for this problem if we're at a minimum or a maximum? It doesn't really matter what v's are, because this term is 0. So 0 times something is, is still 0. So do we know if we're at, an, at, a, at a minimum or at a maximum? A minimum, because it's convex. Okay. We know that we're at a minimum because this is a convex function. These terms are all coefficients, positive coefficients squared. So. That's the idea from convexity from the prior class coming into play there. What? Sorry. I just thought I understood that the v should be like a, either like a 0 or a 1. Aren't you multiplying it by Vs are not zeros or ones. They're, they're constants. They're just they're numbers that will 
we call them the Lagrange multipliers. We're going to interpret V1 and V2 in a minute, but they don't have to be 0, 1. They can be any constant value of, of e either sign. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to erase this then and just work it on a bit of theory back onto this original equation that I've left up here. So in the second half of this page, we're asking what does this Lagrange function look like for any particular derivative. We've looked at a specific example, but let's look at this in general. In general, when we find the first derivative of this Lagrange function, we can see that we can differentiate either with respect to the x's or with respect to the v's. So there's two major sections as written up here. The first part is we can find dl by dx, and let's call this a general xi. Okay. Remember, if you look back at the notation on the first page, i is equal to 1 to up to lowercase n. So there's n search variables. So we can take the Lagrange multiplier and differentiate it n times with respect to x1, x2, up to xn. And if you do so, we can do this symbolically here. The derivative of the first part is the derivative of f with respect to xi. And if we look at the second part, we can do that symbolically. That second part is a function of x, and so we have to differentiate this as well. And if you do that, it, the sum of the derivatives using that formula from calculus, we still have the summation ap appear over there, times vk times the derivative of h with respect to x, i. So we take the kth constraint partial with respect to x, i. And that's set equal to 0. Why do I write it like that? Well, let's, um, let's see what the insight is that we gain from this. Simplify this equation a little bit. We get that the partial derivative of f with respect to x, i, is equal to then the summation of k equals 1 to m times the Lagrange multipliers times dhk by dx. Okay, and if you want to write that even more generically, that comes to the partial derivative of f is then equal to the sum of the Lagrange multipliers multiplied by the partial derivative with respect to h. And that will remind you of something that you saw earlier, right at the start of the class. So I'll give you a, another minute just to get that down. In fact, it is printed in your slides just a little bit further down. The interpretation of this is simply what you saw there earlier, that the gradient at the optimum is equal to a sum of the gradients of the constraints. Okay, and in that geometric picture I drew right at the start of the class, we only had one constraint. So therefore, the gradient of the function was equal to some scalar constant, vk, times the gradient of that one constraint. But if we've got two or three constraints, it's equal to a weighted sum of the gradients of the constraints. In particular, for the case of one constraint, it simply says that the gradients are, are equal to each other. Your delta H is here. The gradient of the constraint. So H is the symbol we're using for the constraints. OK, so the. General Lagrange method must gel with our geometric interpretation we saw there earlier. We can do the second part, and you've done that actually in the example. You take the partial derivative of the Lagrange function with respect to v's, the, the Lagrange multipliers, and what you get then is you simply recover the individual constraints back again. So I won't um, write that up on the board other than the final 
the final solution then is that h of k is equal to b of k. So if you take the partial derivatives with respect to the multipliers, um, perhaps note that the, that is due to the partial derivative of L with respect to the Lagrange multiplier. OK, so let's, um, let's take this then a little step further to wrap up the theory. is that what you'll notice is that by doing this, there are how many equations? How many equations have we derived when we take all these partial derivatives? In the example, we had five equations. But if we write that symbolically, what is it as a n's and m's and n plus 2, n plus? n is the number of search variables, m is the number of constraints, n plus m. N plus m. So we'll always get n plus m equations in n plus m unknowns. So back to 3e, right? This is simply solving a set of nonlinear equations, which is why we learned this stuff in 3e. Solving n plus m equations in n plus m unknowns. What do we remember from that problem in 3e? Is it trivial to solve that? What are the difficulties associated with that? As long as they're not independent. As long as they're independent, it's okay. Okay, as long as the equations are all independent, it's, it's, you're going to get a solution? Yes? No? No one remembers 3E? <laughs> Repressed memories? Okay, so n plus m equations, nonlinear, and n plus m unknowns will solve for, linear, for a linear set of equations. For nonlinear set of equations, we might get multiple solutions. We might get no solutions. Okay, it's, a, it's a tough problem to solve. So we haven't necessarily made life easier for us by doing and using the Lagrange multiplier approach. Some of the problems that limit its usefulness are that you now have to solve a fairly difficult set of n plus m equations in n plus m unknowns that may have zero solutions or multiple solutions. Okay, so you should make note of that there. The other problem is, of course, that every constraint adds another term to your Lagrange multiplier, uh, adds, adds another term to your Lagrange function. So if you've got problems with multiple constraints, you now get a fairly large function being built up, which you have to then calculate partial derivatives for. Okay, so this isn't necessarily what's used, but it does point to some ways in which optimizers work. Optimizers will take this then and modify the method slightly. Okay, so let's um, perhaps move on then and just interpret the last part here is try and understand and interpret the Lagrange multipliers. Yes, Mark? You always get a unique solution if, it's, if they're all linear though, right? If you, they're a linear set of in, uh, independent set of linear equations, you'll always get a unique solution. Okay, we're going to come back to that actually in the next class. Okay, so here's, here's another problem for you. I'll just, I'll set it up. You're actually not going to solve it. It's something that you can go verify easily at home. We're going to solve in this particular problem um, the dimensions for a cylindrical tank. So take a cylindrical tank. We've got length or height, if you want to call it capital L and you've got diameter d. And what we want to do is find the length and the diameter, so two search variables, l and d, so that we get a minimum surface area. So there's the equation for surface area. You can verify that for yourself. It includes the top and the bottom. Is it obvious what the length and the diameter should be to get a minimum surface area? Gut feel? What should the length and the diameter be to get a minimum surface area of a cylinder? <laughs> okay, we have a constraint then to avoid Mark's trivial situation where, where the tank must hold some volume, 500 meters cubed. 
Okay, so it's not zero length and diameter, but that, that would be the case if you solved it in GAMS without the constraint. Any other expectations? D and L have to be close to the same value. So let's see how this plays out. Um, there's your objective function with one equality constraint. You can set up the Lagrange multipliers, do this at home, and take the partial derivatives. There's the first partial derivative with respect to D. There's the partial derivative with respect to L. And there's the constraint. Notice the constraint simply says the tank volume must equal 500. So there's your three equations. So make sure you can understand that at home. If you solve them, you can do so quite easily on by hand. And again, you should prove that you can do this. And you get exactly what Brandon expected. L equals D equals 8.6 meters in this example. OK, and then the surface area of that tank is 348 meters squared. OK, now let's try and understand what the interpretation of the Lagrange multiplier is. I can state it up for you here in text, and we're going to look at it mathematically. For the Lagrange multiplier, a value of vi, whatever that vi is, for a particular constraint, it says that, uh, I've realized I've, I've screwed up my notation here. This should be vk and hk. I've, it's just my subscript, I've switched to a different system. Just use k's rather in that entire sentence, replace i's with k's. I apologize for that. OK, so for a general multiplier vk for, this, for the kth constraint, vk represents the change in objective function value for a one unit increase in the b value. Let's take a look at that. Go right back just to this definition over here. OK, and I'm going to, in fact, just write it out for the one constraint that we have. So L of xv is equal to my function f of x. If we have just one constraint, that s summation simplifies down to minus v1 times h1 of x minus b1. Okay. So what we're trying to understand and answer here is what is the effect of changing b1 by one unit? How can we interpret this v1 value? So what we see then, if everything else is fixed, f of x is fixed, h1 of x is fixed, if I increase b1 by one unit, so I write it as b1 plus 1, OK? That's going to get multiplied here by a minus v1. It's going to multiply it. My L of x v is going to increase by plus v1 units. Okay. So the interpretation of the Lagrange multiplier then, here it's written for you, that it represents the change in the objective function if we had a one unit increase in the left hand s in the in the right hand side value bk so given this tank example the tank example had a lagrange multiplier of 0.465 discuss that interpretation with the person next to you in this particular example how do you interpret that 0.465 So I'm telling you that the Lagrange multiplier, if you had calculated, was 0.465. You can go verify this at home. But what is the interpretation of that? Just, uh, just discuss it a bit. Do you have a question, though? No. Yeah. That's your volume. Yeah. Which is the exact same. 
Okay, so uh, anyone want to answer the interpretation of the V1 value equal to 0.465? No takers, Mark? Um, for every like, increase, for every change in um, your like, total volume, you'll be changing your service area by that. No? Okay, so if I went and took my constraint, currently pi d squared L over 4 equals 500, and I modified this to 501. So I wanted to add one extra meter cubed to the tank. And you'll increase your surface area by 0 0.4. The surface area will increase by 0 0.465 meters squared. Okay. So every one unit increase in the value of BK, BK is the value on the right hand side of your constraint, leads to an increase in the objective function by that amount given by the marginal value. So it's interpreted exactly like a marginal value, exactly like we saw in the LP case. And if you run the GAMS output, in fact, it gives you the marginal value 0.465. Okay, so I've, it's instructive to go copy and paste this GAMS output, sorry, this GAMS code up here and verify the output and make sure that you can interpret the table of results in GAMS. But there it is. We've done it by hand, and here is the computer printout. So you should be in a position to interpret those marginal values. That you, can, you can prove that by hand. Okay, so it's a simple calculation to prove that it's 4 over d. Yeah. So that's why I'm, I, I didn't solve it for you in class. I left it for you at, as, as work at home. Okay, so what I we've got uh, a few minutes left. I'm just actually going to skip over to the, the last page of your handouts and talk just a little bit about the projects. Okay, so last tutorial, um, I had a chance to meet with a good number of you, and those were incredible discussions, a lot more useful than uh, trying to discuss things by email. So what I'm going to do is... Do you guys have another class after this? Some do. some do, some don't. Those of you that have not yet had a chance to discuss, I'm going to be around here for a little while. Actually, let me correct that. I have to go to another meeting, and then I'll come back. Um, so you can either come find me here or find me in my office. Sorry, I forgot about this meeting. It's so annoying. Um, <laughs> meetings are the worst bane of my existence. Uh, so. We've got, we've got to meet face to face because this is a really good way to make sure that you're on the right track. But here's some guidance if, if you're uh, looking for some and a crucial thing that you have to take, take action on. You have to sign up for a meeting time with me. This is a formal meeting. This is not just this informal meeting that I'm suggesting here in class. I'm suggesting a formal meeting. There's 35 slots available. The link is posted on the course website for you to select your slot. First come, first serve. Most of the slots are in the tutorial time, so it's going to take no extra time in your day. You're there already for the tutorial. The meeting is about 9 to 10 minutes, and these will be the questions I'll be looking at, asking you. Those of you that have had a face-to-face -face meeting with me already, these are exactly the, the same questions I've asked you before. So you're in good shape. To, if you've had your pre-meeting with me. If you haven't had a pre-meeting with me, um, please make sure you, you iterate through these questions by email. There's an important part written down here for those of you that are doing optimization problems where you're using a simulator such as BioWin or Aspen. Okay? When you're using Aspen or BioWin, you don't have the functions f of x. You don't have the constraints, constraints h of x or g of x less than or equal to zero. Okay, so what are, what are you doing there? Well, you're going to have to use a system called the Nelda Mead optimizer, a derivative-free optimizer. It's a very easy optimization technique. We don't cover it in this course because it's so easy. But if you Google Nelda Mead, there's some amazing codes and some amazing simulations and techniques. The algorithm is shown in, in some great detailed steps. Okay? Now, there's very few of you that are doing that. But for those of you that are, that's useful to know. Okay. So please book your meeting slot right away so that you get the time that you'd like. It's either there's slots on Friday or Monday or time on Wednesday.